Good afternoon. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being with us here today, June 26, 2019, for our uh, UNC Cancer Network lecture. This is our medical and surgical oncology lecture. Just a few preliminaries and then we'll meet our guest and get started. So uh, let me just let you know that we have a survey coming up. This is very important to us because this is your opportunity to tell us what you want to see and hear in 2020. So you'll be seeing that in your email no later than sometime next week. Please take just four or five minutes to answer that survey. We had a great response last year. We hope to have an even better response this year. And we do listen to you. And we will be looking at your answers very carefully and uh, creating a, a 2020 lecture lineup based on that information. All right. Uh, we also rely on social media to spread the word about this free lecture series. Please, uh, today I'm asking that you go to LinkedIn. That's linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash UNCCN. Follow us on LinkedIn and please help spread the word about these free and wonderful oncology lectures. So I uh, hope you'll take just a minute to do that today. We will be using Poll Everywhere for our uh, for our interactive component to today's lecture. So two ways you can join us. Uh, one is you can go on your phone and type in the uh, two field, 22333. In the message field, type in UNCCN. You'll get a message back that says join, and then you can respond there. Even easier, you can just go to polev.com forward slash UNCCN. You'll see the questions pop up as we ask them, respond to those. And then at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Carey. So uh, it's all anonymous. Take advantage of that opportunity to interact and make the lecture even better. All right, and without further ado, we would like to introduce you to our guest today, Dr. Lisa Carey. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's see what we know about you. Uh, Dr. Carey Richardson and Marilyn Jacobs, prior distinguished professor in breast cancer research, is a board certified, is, and you're board certified in medical oncology. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay, and clinical interest in breast cancer, and also chief of hematology oncology, and physician in chief at the NC Cancer Hospital, and associate director of clinical sciences at Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. That's right. All right, good. So what's, so what, good. So what's one thing we should know about you that's not on our uh, bio there? Oh, not on the bio. Not uh, on the bio. Well, I have three children in their 20s. Wow. And uh, three dogs. So wow, good for you. Equally for sweet, you. all of them. Yeah. So it's a, keep, we keep a lot of chaos in the household. I'll bet you do. I'll bet you do. Well, thank you again. Let's, let's see. So we do have that first Poll Everywhere question. And so about how many people, and I should specify this is in the United States, die of breast cancer each year? Um, so if you believe that the, the, in our audience now that this number is 20,000, go ahead and select A, 30,000 B, 40,000 C or 50,000 D. So all of those are extremely sobering numbers. But, but for the U.S., which one of those do you believe to be correct? And again, this is anonymous. Take just a moment to do that in our audience. And while you're doing that, I'll take care of our disclosures. This activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. Dr. Thomas Shea consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. Dr. James Cockhill, MD, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. The speaker, Lisa Carey, MD, has no conflict of interest relevant to this presentation. Let's take a look at that poll everywhere. So we've, we've got lots of folks saying that 40,000 number, some with the 50,000, 30,000, and, and 20,000 in smaller numbers. Which one of those is actually correct? C is correct. C is correct. So a yeah, huge correct. number yeah. um, and, and very have a very number. informed audience. We I think do. we can stop right here. We, we, where's that? <laughs> We're done. But, but I'm going to guess that there are a few things you're going to, to inform them about that they don't already know. So let, let's proceed. Um, metastatic breast cancer with Lisa Carey, MD, and I'll hand over the cursor to you as thank well. you so much. Well, All it's right. a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you, Tim. Um, so we're just going to talk about principles of managing metastatic breast cancer, soup to nuts. Um, so, in fact, on the first slide, you can see about 40,000 deaths a year from in the U.S. It's 
on a proportional basis declining over time uh, because of advances, particularly in HER2 positive disease. The median survival um, is two to three years, but extremely variable, uh, particularly across the subtypes with, again, the advances being particularly in HER2 positive, less so in ER, uh, ER positive. And then, to be honest, we haven't made much of a budge in triple negative. Um, and of course, remember, the prevalent population of metastatic breast cancer patients in the U.S. is about 200,000 women who are living with the disease. So by definition, if you're an oncologist, you're a breast cancer specialist. Yeah, I mentioned this, these numbers, so the percentage of patients that are not newly diagnosed with metastatic disease on a yearly basis um, is about 15 to 20 percent HER2 positive. That is going down because of the effectiveness of adjuvant therapies, about 15 to 20 percent triple negative, and about uh, 60 to 70 percent are actually hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. It's worth noting, uh, and anyone who works in the clinic knows that, uh, that we do have particular sites of tropism in breast cancer. I'm going to particularly mention uh, bone a little later on because it's such a common site, and recognizing that it does differ by subtype, with bone being the dominant site for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative, and really comprising only about 10 to 15 percent in, in triple negatives, for example, where the visceral um, and CNS disease tend to be more dominant. So I think the, what we're sort of getting at is the fact that metastatic breast cancer, although it sounds like one entity, is actually pretty heterogeneous, and, and that plays out now in increasingly complicated approaches to therapy. The things that contribute and are, can be emblematic of the heterogeneity of the disease, in fact, are characteristics of the disease itself, widely variable disease-free intervals. I just saw a patient who went 20 years between her original cancer and, and the diagnosis of metastatic disease of otherwise identical uh, tumor. Sites and volume of disease, tumor burden, for example. Tempo, in terms of how quickly it's evolving once it comes back. Prior therapy, which can shift the nature of the disease. And then the obvious hormone receptor and HER2 status. There's also relevant uh, characteristics of the patient, of course, the performance status, comorbid conditions, and then increasingly host factors that relate to how the immune response is playing a role and how the, how the host metabolizes the drugs we give. So this is a, a uh, slide that I keep having to update, which is a nice problem to have. I'm happy to do it, which is if you look, the explosion of cancer therapies is particularly writ large in breast cancer therapy. And you can see sort of the laundry list starting in the 50s where there are only a couple of drugs to once you get into the thousands, it's sort of a dot, dot, dot with lots and lots of new drugs. This has made this a much more complicated disease and does reflect the segmenting of breast cancer. Um, we are becoming more splitters than lumpers, and I think for good biologic reasons. So a couple of, of stipulations in terms of, of guiding principles of care. The first is all therapy is palliative. So by definition, you have to keep in mind that what you're trying to do is no longer curative intent, it's palliative intent. And so as I say to patients, you know, the control of the disease and the quality of life are equally highly valued um, goals of therapy. It is true that survival has increased, and so quality of, of life becomes particularly important there. Um, survival typically depends on the tempo. Biology of the tumor is key, and in particular, biology of the tumor as it relates to response to the drugs we give, um, which is probably why surveillance, for example, doesn't seem to matter in terms of outcomes. So picking up metastatic disease early doesn't seem to affect outcome. And as mentioned, the goals of treatment are control, maximizing quality of life, and minimizing treatment toxicity. And those two latter things actually toggle against each other. Quality of life, if it's deteriorated because of symptoms of the cancer, you might want to be more aggressive and accept some treatment-related toxicities. But if the patient is asymptomatic, you cannot improve on that. And so if you give them treatment toxicity, you will not be helping them. So let's talk about systemic therapy. I'm a medical oncologist, so that will be the focus of the conversation. As you see, basically, you know, in the, in the greater sense, we start with tumor phenotypes, and these are basically kind of guideline-driven approaches, which you have to individualize but are good for getting started. As you have advanced breast cancer and appropriate for therapy, patients with hormone receptor positive um, uh, treatment and HER2 negative get endocrine therapy as their primary treatment. I'll mention some of the additional therapies that I call sort of additional add-on therapies. The driving part of the therapy, of course, is the endocrine therapy. You do add on some other drugs that help the endocrine therapy be more effective. 
When they become refractory to endocrine therapy, usually after the first or second line or sometimes third line, then they become really appropriate for the kind of therapy you would give to a hormone receptor negative because in a sense, hormonally, uh, hormone um, endocrine therapy refractory disease is essentially treated as an ER negative disease. Now, once you get into that paradigm, you have, if they're HER2 positive, you have chemotherapy or endocrine therapy, to be honest. Um, you, can, you can go either way because uh, the HER2 targeting becomes a key element. Um, that goes on sort of longitudinally. If they're HER2 negative, you're dependent on chemo. Now, there are clinical practice guidelines that are super helpful in this regard. I'm showing you some of them here. The, the references are on the bottom. Um, uh, in fact, there's an advanced breast cancer um, ESO, ESMO, so the European Medical Oncology. Several uh, uh, Americans participate in that. It's a really a um, transnational uh, conference. And the next one is happening this fall. They do it every two years. So there will be more consensus coming up in terms of clinical practice, but there, there are some uh, guidelines for you to work from. General principles. Hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. Endocrine is generally preferable to chemotherapy in the first line. You can add targeted agents to the endocrine therapy, and these include CDK4-6 inhibitors, mTOR-directed therapy, and PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, any HER2 negative breast cancer patients who are receiving chemotherapy, so this is sort of global, single agents are better than combinations with the exception of symptomatic disease. So, so immediately life-threatening disease where you're going to have basically one crack at it, you're better off with combinations simply because the response rate is higher, but the, um, uh, you, don't, you also buy higher toxicity and not longer survival. Um, you have to balance outcome versus toxicity and quality of life. There is no single optimal first or later line therapy and it's perfectly appropriate to incorporate patient um, uh, variables into your decision making. Um, in HER2 positive uh, breast cancer, the HER2 directed therapy is the mainstay. You can add that to endocrine therapy as I mentioned earlier. If you're going to be giving it with chemotherapy in the first line, it's a taxing trastuzumab. Pertuzumab is the, is the preferred with second line TDM1. I will talk about these in a little bit. So let's start with endocrine therapy because now we're starting with the paradigm. Let's start within hormone receptor positive breast cancer and what the endocrine therapy. Basically, these fall into two categories in the adjuvant setting of premenopausal approaches and postmenopausal approaches that are outlined here with premenopausal tamoxifen, ophorectomy incorporated either alone or with other things, and of course, uh, postmenopausal options um, uh, as, as would be for any other thing. In truth, when a premenopausal patient develops metastatic cancer, you're going to make them postmenopausal either surgically or medically. And so essentially the arrow is conferring the, the reality that unless the patient very strongly uh, uh, will not allow you to make them postmenopausal, actually ablating or suppressing the ovaries is a key component of their therapy, which puts them essentially into the right-hand column, which is all of the options that would be appropriate for postmenopausal patients are appropriate for them once you have ovarian suppression on board. And you can see a list that I will talk about in a second. So here are the data regarding ovarian suppression or ablation. It really is a, a dealer's choice to some degree. Um, they should be essentially equivalent. If the patient is breaking through on suppression, then you are uh, not adequately doing it and you have to rethink it. But in general, ovarian suppression is quite effective. And you can see, for example, patients with uh, ER positive metastatic breast cancer were randomized to tamoxifen, uh, ovarian suppression, or both. And you can see here uh, essentially a response rate that was better with the combination um, than with either one alone, but all seem to be effective and produce both responses and a reasonable progression-free and overall survival. So you can consider ovarian suppression therapeutic. It opens the door for highly effective postmenopausal drugs, and it should be considered standard of care in this setting. So what about uh, AI versus tamoxifen in postmenopausal? So we're going to talk about now what are the postmenopausal options to add in here. Um, so uh, AIs, as you see here, anastrozole versus letrozole versus exemestane, there have been several studies that essentially have shown very similar things, which are uh, AI uh, and tamoxifen is very similar, um, at least as good, uh, probably better, and to be honest, all of the uh, aromatase inhibitors are very, very uh, similar in terms of their effectiveness. This has been demonstrated both adjuvantly, neoadjuvantly in the metastatic setting. Um, 
there are very little data comparing each of them against each other in combination, for example, with CDK4-6 inhibitors or mTAR inhibitors. That's okay. I don't think it matters enormously, and you should be using these things according to your algorithm for treatment, um, not expecting there to be much of a difference in behavior depending on whether you're adding uh, uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor or mTOR inhibitor. So what about fulvestrant? So the fulvestrant story is a little bit complicated by what the ways in which we have studied these drugs. In truth, the Falcon study, um, which is illustrated here, demonstrated that when you dose fulvestrant appropriately um, uh, and compare it to a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor in the first-line setting, this is in endocrine therapy naive patients, which is not the, the norm in my clinic, but um, uh, it, is, it is true that the fulvestrant probably outperforms the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor in the first-line setting. As you can see, it's a modest difference, but uh, it is a very good drug. Um, now, if the patients have had a prior AI, theoretically, it might even be a bigger difference. Um, we don't actually know that because it hasn't been tested, but it's a reasonable assumption. But the CDK4-6 inhibitor first-line trials generally all use the aromatase inhibitors, uh, with the, a couple of exceptions. And in fact, as you're strategizing, you should be thinking longitudinally about not just what you're going to use first, but what's second, what's third, and where is the evidence the strongest. So what about second line? In, this, in most cases, because of the way the trials were designed, this was after uh, failure of a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor. You see here the SOFIA trial, which was fulvestrant versus exomestane, so it's fulvestrant, uh, a uh, selective estrogen receptor downregulator, versus exomestane, a steroidal aromatase inhibitor, essentially no difference. So if you're going to use a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, uh, particularly if you're using with the CDK4-6 inhibitor first, Next, you can use either fulvestrin or exomestane. Now, if you're going to use exomestane, there, there are very good data from a phase three trial of the Everolimus. This was the first of the Everolimus studies um, where in the second line setting, which showed a substantial advantage. It does improve PFS. It did not improve overall survival. This has been replicated with other drugs, tamoxifen, fulvestrin. I suspect that Everolimus adds you know, reasonably, again, from a production-free survival standpoint, to most of the endocrine therapies that we give. Um, the, the downside of it, of course, is that it is a little bit of a difficult drug to give. Stomatitis is a big problem, and you do see some other unusual things, some hyperglycemia and pneumonitis, and so you have to manage it more actively than you do simple endocrine therapy. But it is a good adjunctive drug. Let's talk more about the cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitors. These have become a mainstay of care. The role is in hormone receptor positive breast cancer at this point. They are being studied in other settings, particularly HER2 positive breast cancer, but at the moment it's, a horm it's really for ER positive disease. Uh, the rationale is because of the dependence on the cyclin D1, which is a transcriptional target of ER in this setting. D1 activates for, uh, CDK4-6, uh, causes transition in cell cycle entry. If you block that, you will block the effect. Um, there are three drugs. They have similar efficacy. I will go into them in detail, um, or not too much detail, just enough for this purpose. Um, uh, palbocyclib, abemocyclib, and ribocyclib, and as, uh, as is highlighted here, and I'll talk about this more later, the main difference among them, as far as I can tell and as far as we know, is really um, the toxicity with more neutropenia as a major toxicity for palbo, more GI toxicity with abema, and a problem with QTC interval prolongation with ribocyclobes, which requires monitoring EKG. So we'll start with palbocyclob because it was the first, um, uh, and you can see here Paloma 2 and Paloma 3. So you have the first line setting on the top with a substantial improvement in uh, progression-free survival, uh, uh, which was, uh, you know, essentially very, very similar, about doubles the progression-free survival from 14 to 25 months, um, highly significant and beginning from the, you know, starting at the very beginning. It was approved in 2015 for this setting. On the bottom is the Paloma 3, um, which, again, had a sim similar proportional effect on progression-free survival. The absolute difference is smaller because as you get into later lines, of course, the patient's progression-free survival with anything tends to go down. Um, and, so, uh, and so you see that also in the pretreated setting. Um, the overall survival, there was about a you know, 28 to 30-month uh, survival difference, which was not statistically significant. 
it is consistent with what we would expect given the impact on progression-free survival. Um, this has been approved for both lines. You do have to monitor white cells, so patients have to come in quite frequently, particularly in the beginning because of the impact on, uh, with neutropenia. Um, and so, of course, this is, requires more uh, intense therapy for patients than simple endocrine therapy. I think one of the biggest challenges we have for PALBO and other CDK4-6 inhibitors is to figure out which patients are going to be doing fine for many years so that you can incorporate it on just AI alone or fulvestrin alone and you don't need these extra drugs. We don't actually have that information yet, but that's an area of very active investigation. Um, I think most of us would really like to know who we would, could just give a pill to without monitoring for a number of years. Uh, ribocyclob, there's been three large trials that are sort of outlined here. I think this is in your enduring materials. First line setting, uh, progression-free survival, uh, not reach versus 15 months, highly statistically significant. Biggest problem with this that differentiates it from the others is a QTC prolongation in a small number, but you do have to monitor the, with EKGs on this drug. Um, Mona Lisa 3 had a fulvestrant background bone in both first and second line therapy, um, progression-free survival augmentation. These, this hazard ratio of 0.5 to 0.6 is pretty consistently seen in all of these studies with all of these drugs. Um, it's kind of the answer if you have to take your boards or retake your boards. If somebody asks you the hazard ratio of improvement with a CDK4-6 inhibitor added to endocrine therapy and metastatic disease, if you answer 0.55, you will be pretty much assured to be right. Um, it didn't seem to matter the line of therapy, so that does raise the question of fulvestrin introduced earlier if you would like to. Mona Lisa 7 is unique in that it really looked at this in a premenopausal setting um, with ovarian suppression, either tamoxifen or an AI with or without ribo. Very, very similar impact. And at ASCO this year and published simultaneously in the New England Journal was the overall survival, which was statistically significant, not reached in the, in the um, ribo arm versus 41 months in the, non, in the control arm. So it's been FDA approved also for about three years. And I think one of the questions for people is you have more and more data emerging. Are there differentiating features? Does the survival advantage here matter enough and feel like it's different enough to make the QTC uh, matter? And in truth, all of these uh, drugs are being pursued in multiple settings and trying to uh, get them very, very streamlined for clinical use. And then ABEMA. So the last one is ABEMA, and I have here Monarch 1 and Monarch 2 outlined, second line, single agent. So one of the unique features about ABEMA cyclob is some real evidence of single agent activity um, with a response rate of about 15 to 20 percent. That's a little unusual with this class of drugs. It does have a different toxicity profile, which does illustrate that it seems to be a little bit of a different drug with diarrhea being the main uh, uh, toxicity. Personally, I find that the neutropenia is more of a problem for me. The diarrhea is more of a problem for the patient, and sometimes that helps you one decide which of these drugs to use since the clinical effect seems to be very similar. And you see here phase 3 fulvestrin with or without a bemocyclob in second line, hazard ratio 0.55. Um, uh, Monarch 3 in the first line setting, hazard ratio 0.54. Uh, this was added to an AI. So again, very, very consistent. Um, I have here not yet approved. I meant to delete that. Uh, it is actually an approved drug. And then finally, let's get to some of the newer things, alpelisib. Um, alpelisib added to fulvestrin. Um, this is a super interesting uh, uh, and I think practice changing in a variety of ways, which I'll explain. Alpelisib is a PI3 kinase uh, inhibitor. This has been a class of drugs that's been the, you know, the drug of the future for a number of years in, in breast cancer. Um, in, in this trial uh, uh, called SOLAR-1, um, PI3 kinase mutant cohort was tested with alpelisib added to fulvestrin or a placebo added to fulvestrin. As a proof of principle, they also did a non-mutant cohort that was smaller um, with the same basic design, and you can see the mutant uh, pa the patients with uh, tumors that carry the mutation on the left with a you know, statistically significant improvement in uh, progression-free survival with the addition of alpelisib. On the right, no real impact. Again, this appears to be a, a hitting the target that you expect it to. So this was, in fact, approved just last month. Um, and, and the reason I said it's practice changing isn't just that we now have another drug in the armamentarium. It is also that you now have 
a reason that you need to look at do DNA sequencing in metastatic breast cancer, which we have not had a drug that DNA mutations were relevant for um, in the somatic tissue. We've had germlines, but not somatic. So that's a, that's a real difference. So here is our endocrine algorithm in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. If they're premenopausal, ovarian ablation suppression, a nonsteroidal AI I think is very conventional. You can add one of the three CDK4-6 inhibitors. Upon progression, consider fulvestrin. If they didn't get a CDK4-6 inhibitor, would consider that. If they have a PI3 kinase mutation, consider adding alpelisib. You always have the option to go to exemestane, um, and you can consider adding everolimus. Um, or you can go to chemotherapy if you have a sense that this tumor is simply, you know, insensitive to antiestrogen therapy. And then as you go down the lines, there are additional endocrine options. There are also chemo options. So speaking of mutations, um, let me switch, switch uh, gears a little bit to germline mutations and the impact of germline mutations, um, which, you know, only affect about 10% of our patients. But in those patients, we have a class of drugs that actually works and is quite effective. So what's shown here are the two uh, primary trials that are driving current care. There are others coming. Um, Olympiad, uh, in which HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, in which the patient carries a germline BRCA mutation, relatively untreated. They had to have had prior anthracycline and taxane, and they couldn't have had developed resistance to a platinum. Those are, that's key across all of these because of some um, cross-resistance between PARP inhibitors and uh, platinum resistance. So all of these trials ex exclude um, uh, patients with platinum resistance. That's an unknown answer uh, whether that works or not. But in this trial, Olaparib was the PARP inhibitor given against chemo of physician's choice, physician and patient, I would say, probably, um, capecitabine, ribulin, or, or venerelbine. On the bottom is Embraca, very, very similar design virtually identical, except that the PARP inhibitor was telazoparib. Um, both were progression-free survival endpoints. Uh, and here you see progression-free survival uh, for Olympiad with a hazard ratio of point, you know, just between 0.5 and 0.6 again. Um, on Ambraca, hazard ratio again in favor of the um, uh, PARP inhibitor. Uh, they were also, they were both better. They were both similarly better what I'm not showing here is the quality of life. These are, these are more, less toxic than chemotherapy, at least the second-line chemotherapy that was used in both these trials. Neither one has shown much of an overall survival advantage. I would also tell you that you know, I listed the uh, treatment of physician's choice options. The talazoprib trial added vitorelbine. I think all of, uh, most of us would argue that those are second-line options. We don't know how these drugs would compare to first-line therapy. We certainly don't know how they would compare to a platinum. That's okay. These are these are terrific drugs. They're less. They're much more tolerable, and they're oral, so I think they're quite reasonable to use if you know the patient has a germline BRCA uh, mutation. What we don't know, and what happens in maybe five percent of tumors, is a somatic acquisition of BRCA one or two mutations, and we don't yet know the impact. Although there's some data coming out, I think maybe hopefully by the end of this year, regarding um, the activity of these drugs in patients with germline normal BRCA, but in which the tumor has acquired mutations, because there's an argument that they probably will work there, and hopefully we'll know soon. Now, what about chemotherapy? So, again, either triple negative disease or hormone receptor positive that has become endocrine refractory. Essentially, these are about the same in terms of the chemotherapy options. There's lots of options, lots of mechanisms, as are outlined on this slide, um, all of which have a role to play, depending on prior therapy, performance status, existing toxicity, and patient preference. So I mentioned the combination versus single agent. This is a, a summary of, of those uh, issues. You will see higher response rate with the combination. You will see an initial longer time to progression. However, not necessarily of the two given in sequence, but of just one at a time, so I don't think that's particularly germane. Um, survival advantage in drugs that work is seen whether you give it as a single agent or in combination. However, quality of life clearly in favor of the single agent. It's easier to customize, and you have less waste, what we would call wasted toxicity, meaning the patient would have derived benefit from it, uh, and you would have had half the toxicity. So this is why single agent preferred unless response, for example, a very symptomatic patient, is the preferred uh, outcome.
Now, is there a standard first-line agent? So there are a lot of sort of uh, general um, uh, kind of commentary about this. So anthracyclines and taxanes are traditional first-line agents. They may not be that appealing in patients who have relapse very quickly after this class of drugs. We actually don't know what the response rate is in patients who re you know, recently received it in the curative setting. There is no evidence that the sequence of therapies that are chosen is going to affect overall survival. There's no evidence that sequence will affect quality of life in a global sense. There's certainly evidence that individual therapies will have individual toxicities, um, but not as an aggregate. Um, and response, of course, is much more influenced by the line of therapy with a much higher responsiveness to anything in first line versus third line um, than a specific agent. And I think it's totally appropriate to make your treatment decisions very individualized to the patient and in conjunction with the patient. And for this reason, both NCCN and ASCO guidelines generally avoid specific recommendations about agents, and, and there's a reason for that. Now, what about immunotherapy? Um, immunotherapy is uh, uh, something that you know, breast cancer is a little bit late to the party in immunotherapy, I think, for a variety of biologic reasons. And also, we have a lot of other uh, drugs, which is a good thing. Um, but there are some really uh, nice studies coming out, and there's one that has already changed practice. It's outlined here. This is the Impassion 130 trial, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative is among the most immunologically potentially tractable of the three types. Um, HER2 also is, and that's being tested. Um, with ER positive being a little less likely for it to work. Triple negative was chosen. This is in the previously untreated setting with at least a 12-month disease-free interval after uh, adjuvant therapy. And they received nabpaclitaxel, um, and the reason for that is nabpaclitaxel omits the steroid that accompanies uh, other taxanes, and while we don't know if that matters for immunotherapy, that was the reason for this, with or without uh, uh, atezolizumab. Uh, so a PD-1, PDL-1 interacting drug. And you see here's the progression-free survival. This is the intent to treat population. You see the overall population on the top uh, with a uh, hazard ratio of a 0 0.80 and a, a somewhat modest improvement of under two months in the uh, overall population. However, in the pre-specified PDL1 positive uh, group, and, and remember, PDL1 testing is a, you're hitting a moving target because there's a lot of heterogeneity in houses. This is done, it differs by drug, it differs from one tumor to another. In this case, this was a particular um, immunostain that was done actually testing the immune cells in the tumor, um, but in the, that pre specified group with PDL1 positive tumors, there was a two and a half month improvement. Um, uh, in uh, progression-free survival, and you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve is much more impressive on the bottom. And here's the overall survival again in that PDL1 positive group. There wasn't, there was not a statistically significant difference in the overall group, but in the PDL1 positive group, you can see a carryover effect in survival in this group. Now you have a uh, it's basically nearly a 10-month difference in survival uh, with the addition of the immunotherapy to chemotherapy which is the reason it's been approved for pdl one positive metastatic triple negative disease in the first line setting. So that was approved this year. Uh, this is, again, now your standard as you're now trying to figure out what kind of testing do you need to do in your metastatic breast cancer patients. We now have three things. We have DNA sequencing for PI3 kinase mutations. You have germline BRCA1 and 2 so that you know whether a PARP inhibitor will be useful. And third now is pdl one immunostaining on triple negative breast cancer. About 40% of these tumors were positive using this particular assay that was used in this trial. What about, what about chemotherapy otherwise? So let's say the PDL1, if the PDL1 is positive, then you probably will need to, to pair it with the partner that it's approved with. Otherwise, you have a number of choices. This is an example, 40502 was a phase three trial of three antitubule directed drugs. Essentially, paclitaxel, which is sort of easy. The biggest problem with paclitaxel, of course, is neuropathy, but that's true of all of these microtubule-directed drugs. Um, outperformed ixabepilone and was about equivalent to uh, NAD paclitaxel, um, but was the least toxic of all of them. So it's quite reasonable to give that. The other group um, uh, that uh, in, in uh, triple negative platinums have also been demonstrated to be approximately equivalent to the taxane, so those would be probably pretty standard.
Let me expand on that a little bit. The direct DNA damaging agents, there is a reason that there's so much discussion of using platinums and other DNA damaging agents. To be honest, radiation is a DNA damaging agent too. Um, but the reason for that is the role of BRCA and that triple negative breast cancer, even that those without either germline or um, sporadic mutations, seem to st still have abnormalities in the function of, of BRCA and its pathway. And if that is so, we know that BRCA1 aberrations tend to confer sensitivity at DNA damaging agents because that's what BRCA does for a living. It, it repairs D, uh, DNA damage. So if BRCA isn't working, if you damage DNA, it's more likely to kill the cell. The TNT trial is the reason I made the statement earlier that in triple negative, among the first line options are platinum agents. This was a very simple study um, where patients with first line uh, uh, largely triple negative breast cancer got either carboplatin or docetaxel first line, and then they crossed over to receive the other drug second line. Here's the response, and you can see in all patients, essentially, that you saw equivalent response between carboplatin and docetaxel. The interesting thing, which actually is what you would predict if you believe in the importance of BRCA1 in, um, or, or BRCA2 in DNA damage, you would say, well, probably if they have a germline mutation, then probably the platinum's going to do better because they can't repair that damage, and that's exactly what they saw in the small number of germline BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers in this study. You can see basically a doubling of the response rate, which was, I think, reassuring to them and people who work in this field. What about other drugs? Aribulin, of course, has been studied against treatment of physician's choice. This is a very famous phase 3 trial, which, uh, uh, you know, an antitubule drug. It's been around now for several years. Um, uh, with an overall survival advantage of, you know, two and a half or so months, um, and it's, it's what put aribulin onto the map. Um, in another phase three trial, uh, comparing capecitabine, so oral chemotherapy, the only oral drug that we conventionally use, at least early on, um, uh, compared to aribulin, essentially in the parent trial, there was no significant difference between the two of them. However, there appeared to be an interaction that in triple negative breast cancer, there appeared to be maybe a little more bang for the buck with aribulin. They are really different drugs, and given the absence of survival differences that we're aware of in whatever sequence you pick things, to be honest, I think you're picking these, your next choice of drug based on whether you're more worried about neuropathy or you're more worried about uh, GI toxicity or hair loss and things like that um, with the patient. And this is by highlighting that. Uh, toxicity is a key feature, and here's a laundry list of drugs that we conventionally use in metastatic breast cancer. As everyone knows, frequently these patients are asymptomatic. Frequently we have the opportunity to, to continue their life for several years. They oftentimes receive four or five different drugs. You can pick amongst these, and you should incorporate these toxicities into your decision making. A patient who has pre-existing neuropathy from their adjuvant therapy, you may not want to choose drugs that give more neuropathy. You can really damage their quality of life that way. So this is a, I would argue, should be number one or close to number one in features as you're deciding what to treat patients with. The second thing is, should we be like the lung cancer doctors, and should we give chemo and then stop when you get some response and then restart? And the truth is there have been a couple of studies um, that have examined continued versus interrupted chemotherapy. Um, this is exactly the, the outline of what you would want, a patient, patients who were treated with uh, chemotherapy, and then if they were having response, they were randomized to either continue until progression or observe until progression and then restart. And you can see basically a difference in outcome in favor of continued chemotherapy. The however is they also had ongoing toxicity. So it depends on whether they're tolerating the drugs well or not, this decision. If they're tolerating the drugs fine, I would argue continue them. And if they're having a little bit of toxicity, dose reduce and then continue. There's been a meta-analysis of a number of similar trials asking this question um, that basically, in general, there was a statistically significant uh, uh, advantage in favor of longer duration of chemotherapy, which is kind of getting at the same question, more supporting evidence that if it, all is going well, you should probably continue, continue the drugs. So again, getting back to our chemo, the principles of chemo, which is the palliation, you have to balance efficacy and toxicity. Um, 
There are different principles for HER2 positive disease, so everything I've been talking about so far is in triple negative and endocrine resistant hormone receptor positive. I mentioned the initial therapy, if you have PDL1 being different, after that you have some single agent, you know, if you can, unless you want response, and then a number of drugs are options, many, many choices. So finally, let's talk about HER2 positive disease. There's been an enormous number of advances. So this, this is the reason I kept this for last. Um, uh, starting in 1998 with the, the approval of trastuzumab was the first anti-HER2 drug approved in the metastatic setting and going all the way through to a variety of drugs, lapatinib, pertuzumab, TDM1, et cetera. This is a gift that keeps on giving, and we, do, we are seeing steady improvements in survival uh, uh, because of the importance of these drugs and the effectiveness of them. Here's how they work in general to summarize. You have two main types. Um, there's, there's humanized monoclonal antibodies. The trastuzumab and pertuzumab go against different domains of the, of the external part of the cell. And then you have small molecule inhibitors. Lapatinib and neratinib are the, the key ones now, although there are others coming, which work on the inside of the cell to prevent activation of the signaling pathway. The metanzine analog DM1 conjugated trastuzumab is what TDM1 is. Basically, it, it leverages trastuzumab. So if trastuzumab doesn't work in this patient, nor will TDM1. So basically, I think of it as a, it's a souped up uh, trastuzumab because you basically added a chemotherapy to trastuzumab. So here's the seminal very first paper of trastuzumab added to chemotherapy in metastatic breast cancer, and you can see a substantial improvement in progression-free survival. There was also an improvement in overall survival. Here is the same when you add it to endocrine therapy in HER2-positive disease. You can see added to two different non-steroidals using either trastuzumab, or in this case, it was uh, adding lapatinib. I think that was appealing because you're adding an oral drug to an oral drug as opposed to an infusional drug. Um, and you can see in both cases, to endocrine therapy, you also see an improvement in outcome. You do add toxicity, and if you're giving trastuzumab, you add uh, infusional therapy. At some point, we'll have subcutaneous uh, available to us. It's available in many places. Um, it is okay to just use endocrine therapy because you do add toxicity. Lapatinib has GI toxicity for the same reasons as I outlined before with CDK4-6 inhibitors. You know, if you can get by with just endocrine therapy for a while and then add later, it's, it's not clear that that isn't a good thing to do. I think most people usually co-target HER2, but I'm just saying it is okay if your patient doesn't want to buy the toxicity to, to omit it until the next line. So the first generation of HER2 targeting is, is a couple of, of, of truisms, post trastuzumab progression, Ongoing HER2 targeting works. So there's a reason that once we start, we tend to keep going with HER2 targeting. Lapatinib, TDM1, trastuzumab, all of these work after progression on trastuzumab. There are multiple chemotherapy partners for HER2 targeting. I made a list here. There is no optimal combination, um, so you can choose your chemotherapy partner typically, uh, you know, according to the same paradigms you use for others. In hormone receptor positive HER2 positive disease, you also get a benefit from uh, dual targeting, um, and you can use an AI with either trastuzumab or lapatinib, as I demonstrated just before. It's okay in patients with indolent, asymptomatic, strongly ER-positive disease to wait until the next line. So now let's talk about the fancier drugs uh, uh, that have really changed the landscape. The first is pertuzumab. This is Cleopatra, a super important study uh, that studied the addition of pertuzumab in the first-line setting to a taxane plus trastuzumab. Very large study, very important study. Uh, this is basically why, uh, with a substantial 16-month overall survival advantage with adding pertuzumab, a second monoclonal antibody that targets the heterodimerization domain, added to trastuzumab and a taxane. This is the standard of care for first-line setting if you're going to use a chemotherapy-based regimen. Now, what about trastuzumab emtansine, TDM1, as I mentioned? So this is a uh, super uh, uh, exciting drug. Um, it, is a, it is a chemo analog, metansine. It's an anti-tubule, it's a vinca, basically, but it's too toxic to give by itself. But it, when you add it to trastuzumab, so basically the trastuzumab is a delivery agent, the Trojan horse approach. Um, the, the hypothesis was, does it allow you to omit a separate cytotoxic but still work? And the short answer is, of course, it does.
Here's Amelia, first phase three study, study of TDM1 versus XL, XL being uh, Cape Cytobine plus Lapatinib. Um, and you can see this is in the pretreated setting. Uh, the TDM1 outperformed from an efficacy standpoint as well as from a toxicity standpoint. Although, again, the toxicities are different, you may consider that as you're making these decisions. So here's our next generation summary of HER2 targeting um, with Cleopatra. I've outlined the things. This, this is a, a list of things that have been tried with various uh, uh, varying amounts of success. The ones that are outlined are really the success stories of Cleopatra with that substantial outcome improvement. Amelia, similarly in an outcome improvement, um, uh, also with a significant overall survival advantage. And even Teresa, which was TDM1 versus treatment of physician's choice in a much more pretreated setting, uh, third or later line. So it is worth noting these are super expensive um, uh, uh, drugs, and so part of what you will see in, in ongoing studies is ways of being more tailored and trying to not over-treat as much. It's a harder thing to do in the metastatic setting. It's certainly something that is uh, particularly important in the adjuvant setting, as all of these drugs are also used adjuvantly. I mentioned that oncogene addiction means that HER2, uh, HER2 is still a relevant target after progression. Let me just show you why I made that statement. So this is capecitabine plus or minus trastuzumab after trastuzumab. This is a relatively old study, now about 10 years ago, that just demonstrated that even though a patient had progressed on trastuzumab, added to a different chemo. In addition to changing the chemo, if you continued the trastuzumab, patients would do better. This is why we have it, you know, we continue with HER2 targeting, and it's the nature of the biology. So here's our summary for metastatic options for HER2-positive disease. We have chemo-based options, and there's a sort of list here. You can vary this. This is sort of if all of the things are equal, but if patients wish to be treated with oral therapies. I've had patients who simply do not want to go down the infusional route. So capecitamine and lapatinib is quite reasonable. Endocrine therapy, similar decision-making process. And you can see on the bottom, median survival is increasing, and you have lots of choices. So just take the patient's needs and desires into account and, and be as thoughtful as you can, because you may well be doing this for, on average, four or five years. Here's a, here's a summary with a little more detail, a little more flavor to the multiple lines of, of other options. Um, I think the ongoing questions that, that really are, are undecided is who's better off with endocrine therapy up front rather than the THP, um, uh, recognizing those options. And then last is the only compartment that I'm going to separate out simply because we know that there's different strategies is uh, bone metastases and, and the issue of skeletal related events including pathologic fracture, need for radiotherapy or surgery, or of course the event of, of spinal cord compression. To be honest, we very seldom see hypercalcemia anymore, but when it happens it catches your attention because they get pretty sick. We have a number of uh, bone targeted agents. The radiopharmaceuticals that are so conventional in prostate cancer are really relatively understudied in breast cancer, so I'm not going to talk about them. We have the bisphosphonates um, uh, and the rank ligand inhibitor denosumab. And essentially, to summarize, both work. Um, and I think as we see, we have a substantial reduction in skeletal related events because of the um, introduction of increasingly more effective drugs. Pomidronate was, is no longer used essentially because uh, uh, zolandronic acid really replaced it. There is an additional reduction with denosumab that I think many people uh, prefer because it's also subcutaneous instead of IV. Um, and these bone modifying agents are added to whatever else you're doing if you have patients with bone involvement, particularly lytic bone mets, and, and this is standard and should continue. You now can give them every three months. We used to give them every month, um, and they are a mainstay if patients have bone involvement. So treatment of metastatic breast cancer, where are we? There's been clearly major progress in metastatic breast cancer management. We have multiple hormone receptor and HER2 targeted options. We now have immunotherapy in some triple negative breast cancer patients. We now have PARP inhibition as a mainstay in germline carriers. Um, chemotherapy, however, is not going away. And for many, it's primary or it's key. So triple negative, particularly PL1 negative, it's primary. And it becomes, you know, most of our patients, almost 70% of our patients of all flavors, end up receiving chemotherapy for their metastatic disease at some point. So optimize it and, and be thoughtful in, in taking the patient's needs and, and, and 
uh, other comorbid conditions into account in decision making. Um, involving palliative care and symptom management colleagues early is particularly important in these patients if they have symptoms. Um, you know, the, the thing we are learning uh, increasingly clearly is uh, having them involved early helps with uh, management of symptoms, lets patients live longer. And the goals of therapy remain disease control and quality of life, and they can help with that. Well, thank you all very much. All right. And Dr. Carey, thank you. This has been terrific. Um, I, I know we have uh, a few questions for our audience. So uh, the first one, and this is on Poll Everywhere, which of the following regimens represent acceptable mm -hmm. first-line treatment for a postmenopausal post woman with hormone receptor-positive breast cancer? And I'll let you uh, read the different choices, if you would. So a post... Oh. And, there, and we've already got one person who, <laughs> who's pretty sure somebody, that... Somebody's and, jumping in, right? Yeah, Am I yeah, supposed to wait till they vote? Oh, no, no. Oh, you yeah, can I go ahead because they'll keep coming they'll in. They'll keep and, going. Okay, yeah, but, okay. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the three aromatase inhibitors are essentially equivalent. There's really not much difference in efficacy amongst them. I think most people start with a non-steroidal to begin with simply because the the... The evidence started with non-steroidals and then moved to particularly everolimus with exemestane later. I think that's perfectly fine to mimic that simply because that's the way it was done. I don't know that it actually matters very much. So I think A, A, B, I probably would not use. So low-dose estradiol has been studied in the pre-treated setting. It does have some effectiveness, but it's fairly modest, again, considering the, the nature of the patients who are tested. Same with megestrol acetate. Those are really used in late-line settings, so I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't incorporate them first. And oh, tamoxifen, nice. I think, is reasonable, although most of the data suggests that it, you get a little bit longer progression-free survival with an AI than tamoxifen. Okay. So, so with their 80% at B, looks like they're doing 80, pretty well? 80% at B looks good. All I think right. A or B would have been fine. Great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when chemo... Let's see. Did we oh, what was, what, was, what was four? I don't see what four was. I'm not sure. That might, Let's see. Uh... Go back. Yeah, yeah. And tomorrow, it says any of them. It says any okay. of them, and it says you can use tamoxifen. It's perfectly fine. Okay. And then uh, anything else you want to say about that? I don't think so. I think the full vestrant is a is a question. Mm -hmm. We we dodged that, and we didn't. We dodged a little bit in the question the CDK four six inhibitors, which are typically combined with an AI first. You can now, with some data, combine it with full vestrant, and we didn't incorporate that in the question. So I think okay. it's okay. All right. And then when chemotherapy is administered in the first or second line setting, combination therapy should usually be used. And uh, A, true, B, false. And we'll uh, wait about 10, 15 seconds okay. and give, give our uh, participants an opportunity to vote. Combination, so a doublet instead of single agent chemo. All right. We're, we're pretty evenly split on we're this. Evenly split. Well, and as I mentioned before, the um, you know if a patient is symptomatic or you have impending visceral disease, then combinations can be used. I think in most cases, most patients are asymptomatic and don't have impending visceral crisis, and a single agent um, is quite reasonable and is less toxic. All right, thank you. And anything else you want to say about no, that? No, that's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> we covered it. And uh, third, in a patient progressing on anti-HER2 uh, therapy, which uh, with uh, trastuzumab, subsequent treatments should also include anti-HER2 therapy, and true or false? Well, and, and I think people are already voting uh, mm -hmm. appropriately. You know, that's the post-progression uh, and the reason that HER2 targeting becomes a mainstay. You know, if you mm -hmm. think about it, it's sort of like ER. You know, if you have an ER-positive cancer that um, is still has evidence of endocrine sensitivity, we tend to keep doing that because it is a driver of the biology of that tumor. Mm -hmm. Same thing for HER2. HER2 is an oncogene. There's clearly evidence of what we call oncogene addiction where, you know, even upon progression, continuing the HER2 targeting seems to help manage the disease. Okay. Thank you. So true. True. Mm -hmm. and, and there, there we go. Uh, 
and the, the explanation. All right, uh, we do want to thank uh, the, uh, the General Assembly of North Carolina for their generous support of the mm -hmm. University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I want to acknowledge Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the work that they do to make this and every one of our lectures possible. Uh, for our audience, this is your opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Carey. So either using the texting or the website, the pollab.com forward slash UNCCN. While we're waiting for any questions to come in, I was hoping you might be able to follow up a little bit when you were talking about uh, continued versus interrupted chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so sort of what goes into that decision making process in terms of, uh, obviously you want the, the, the continued, but, but what pushes you over the edge in terms of saying this toxicity, yeah, yeah. What, you know, that, that, that's going to be a difficult it's decision for, yeah. for a medical oncologist. What, what goes into that decision? We know not all toxicity is the same, right? right. So a patient who has some myelosuppression, mm -hmm. right? You know, they have anemia, they have a little bit of, you know, neutropenia. It's not bothering them. Right. It's not enough to, to cause them to have a particularly increased risk of infection. Yeah. I'm not going to change much right. for that. Right. Um, on the other hand, a patient has diarrhea that is is resistant. So I would start mm -hmm. with supportive care measures. Sure, sure. But if the patient's having diarrhea, that's a particularly bothersome side effect, yeah. and, and it interferes with patients getting out and living their lives. So I mm -hmm. think it depends a little on the toxicity. To be honest, I generally dose reduce. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, first start with supportive care, right. then go to, to dose reduction and right. see if you can ameliorate the problems. Mm -hmm. Because if it's working, I don't want to mm -hmm. stop it. Okay. And so that's typically the algorithm. Okay. If, it pa if it makes the patient miserable, though, then stopping mm -hmm. and trying something else is a very reasonable thing to do. Okay. I don't usually leave patients, except in some unusual circumstances, off therapy altogether if they have documented metastatic disease. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we do have some questions that have come in. Is uh, there a role for neratinib in later line metastatic HER2 positive disease? There is. And I, I had neratinib in my list. Mm -hmm. I didn't get into the, the studies with neratinib because they're still evolving a little bit. And it is mm -hmm. clearly seems to have less of a role early on than, you know, HP-based regimens or TDM1 regimens. There's some, some data from an older study. There's some data from a, a more recent one. I mentioned it in one of the, the slides of neratinib outperforming lapatinib in some settings. And so, you know, you've got two of these small molecules. Neratinib is an irreversible um, HER1, HER2 inhibitor compared to lapatinib, which is more reversible. Um, and there's some newer drugs coming out, too. Um, it may be more effective, and it seems to have some uh, management of CNS, uh, some prevention of progression in the CNS better than, than some other drugs. I think the, the downside of neratinib uh, is that it's a, it's a, it can be a hard drug. Uh, management of the diarrhea is, is, can be uh, uh, a, um, an issue. I think we're getting better at it, and I actually think it's going to start moving up in its use, is my guess. Um, Oh, right. Those yes, those yeah, thoughts yeah. on treating patients with leptomenginal disease. Oh. And this will be our, our last I question. Should, yeah, you laid the, the <laughs> hardest for last. Okay. So leptomeningeal disease is a really tough disease. Um, uh, you know, the CNS, I didn't, I didn't do much with the CNS. In truth, most of the drugs that we have, if, this, if the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, as in those with CNS metastases, uh, they typically cross, and the behavior seems to be relatively similar. There are some drugs that do a little better than others. There's some nice reviews. It basically has to do with how big is the drug, how bulky is the drug, and how protein-bound is the drug. And those that are smaller, not bound, um, uh, tend to cross the blood-brain barrier a little better. But, but in truth, a lot of what we do is driven by the systemic component, and you treat the uh, anterior similarly. For leptomeningeal disease, we used to use intrathecal therapy. In truth, we're not using it as much because I think it isn't so clear that it improves outcome. And you do have to, with cytotoxic given intrathecally, you start having uh, a lot of trouble kind of co-managing the systemic disease. I think many people are treating leptomeningeal disease unless it's really symptomatic. And we are picking up more of it on, on the highly sensitive imaging that we use now. Um, unless it's really symptomatic and you have documented cells on, on LP, um, I tend not to use intrathecal therapy. Um, those, those few cases where they clearly have dominant leptomeningeal disease, I'll use intrathecal chemo and, and wish that we had something better, which I think some people are working on. Good, good. Thank you. Let's see a couple of 
Quick, uh, I know it, we're, we're end of time, so just to remind our audience, upcoming live lectures, uh, we have Radiation Oncology 101 on July 10th, um, and then we've got uh, our Best of ASCO 2019 on July 24th. Uh, more self-paced lectures are online. You can take those anytime within the next year and receive credit. Uh, including preparing for patients with uh, preparing patients for treatment with uh, Tammy Allred and uh, prostate cancer screening with Mark Berlin and, and uh, Meredith Crabtree, and then our cancer conversations, medical marijuana and CBD oil. What do we know? That's coming up this Friday, and then July twenty sixth is organic really better eating well for good health with Jennifer Spring. So. Thank you to our audience. Please spread the word about these lectures. Uh, they're all free. The more people we can, we can get attending, the better. So please pass on word about these. Uh, you know where to find us. You know where to find our website. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Lots of other places. Again, spread the word. Dr. Carey, thank you so much. Thank this you. has been a pleasure. Appreciate it. All right.